You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is time for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options. The program where the name says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the futures options side of the fence. What's lighting up the tape this week in, let's say, I don't know, metals, ags, rates, FX. You don't know. You got to tune in every week to find out. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the TAG, optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you folks are binging these days. Don't worry. Keep it up. Unlike Netflix, binging this content is good for your brain out there. So, of course, if you like what you hear, throw a like, a star, a comment. It's available to spy everywhere under the sun. A whole bunch of you enjoying it on the YouTube side these days, which is always fun because it's still an audio show at the end of the day. But however you want to get it, we don't judge out there, including if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us for awesome pro Q&As. We just had my buddy Scott Nations who did a lot on the futures front back in the day, just coming off his Jeopardy run, now joining us on the uh, pro Q&A this week. That was kind of fun for him tackling uh, your questions instead of Ken Jennings' questions this week, as well as, of course, coming up on Friday, we have Options Oddities. We have all the exclusive content we recorded from OIC hitting the pro tape first. So you folks are getting it over there before the rest of the network. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. To learn more, as we learn who's joining us on the old CME Group hot seat today, I am pleased to welcome back on our old buddy, Mr. Rich Excel. He's got some new titles now. He is now the director of the Derivatives and Trading Academy, as well as the co-director of the Investment Management Academy over there at the University of Illinois. Rich, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. Mark, thanks for having me. It's always good to be here. And Rich, a little birdie told me you you may have uh, won an award since the last time we chatted, the Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award. You know, I, I tip my cap to you, sir, as uh, you should definitely you should definitely wear that with pride as someone who went to 
let's say an institution that is widely regarded around the world as as one of the best, supposedly. Uh, when I went there, I was a little surprised to see that uh, the the professor is, let's just say, more interested and definitely better at the research side than on the actual education side that they were getting paid for. So you should definitely wear that award as a badge of honor, sir. I, I appreciate it. It's pretty, it's pretty humbling, uh, you know, for the students and colleagues to uh, give me that award. But uh, you know, it just motivates me to uh, to keep working harder and and delivering that education that you're talking about. I think you're right. I think um, the world's changing, and we need to prepare the students for to hit the ground running because they're being asked to do a lot more right out of the gate. So you're not the professor who has the TAs do everything and you show up once a week for office hours every two hours. That's not you. I don't have any TAs. So uh, oh, wow. it's not me at all. <laughs> there you go. I actually was a TA for a while and I did all the work. I did all the grading, all the lecturing, and the professor just showed up for office hours like once or twice a week. So there you go. Different times, sir. I'm glad to see you're taking the education of the future seriously. As we take this show seriously, it is time for the movers and shakers. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the movers and shakers report. All right, everyone, welcome to the movers and shakers report, the portion of the show where we break down everything lighting it up uh, to the light side and to the dark side this week from an underlying perspective over there at CME Group. If you follow us on social media, follow CME Group, you can get your hands on this report before showtime as well. And maybe not surprising, coming on the heels of everything meme this week, as well as, of course, that cooler than expected CPI number, we have a lot of green on the old screen. Looking at the aggregate, I would say it's roughly 75 to 80% green and roughly 20% red, but still enough to make a, a decent bottom five, if not more than that. Uh, Mr. Rich, you've been on the show once or twice, and as the newly minted Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to teach our listeners a little bit. So rather than have me run through the underlying movers and shakers, don't worry, I'll, I'll do the vol for you. But uh, rather than have me run down the uh, underlying movers and shakers, why don't you take our listeners on a journey this week? You can start wherever you want, break down the light side and the dark side for our listeners this week, Mr. Rich. <clears throat> sure, I'd love to. Um, so, I mean, as you said, it's been a pretty green week for sure. So why not just start right there, right? What Of the things that are green, what's been really leading the way? And as you look at it, um, you know, number five, it's always on it's always on one of the lists because it's uh, a lot of contracts and it's it's not afraid to move is is bitcoin uh, so bitcoin comes in number 5 up about 4.4% on the week um and you know trading about a little over 1000 contracts but i think it starts to get a little bit more interesting as we kind of move up the up the list you got silver um coming in at number 4 up over 5.5% um it was also number 3 to the light side last week interesting to me to see that on there because um you know, you, you you look on X and you start to see all the hashtag silver squeeze, et cetera, with the meme stocks being back as, you know, I know that was, they tried that one before, but silver's probably got a few other drivers besides just the kind of the meme stock craze, but silver has definitely been on everyone's radar the last couple of weeks. Um, <coughs> looking on number three on the list on, on the light side is Nat Gas up f over five and a half, up 5.64%. It was number one to the light side last week. So is, is Nat Gas coming to to life here? Um, you know, that's something that I think every time I'm on this show, Mark, we, we seem to talk about Nat Gas. Is it, you know, where, is it ever going to come back to life, et cetera? Well, it's starting to show some signs of that. And we've seen it the last couple of weeks now. Um, number two on that list is copper. Oh, six and a quarter percent. Um, over 100,000 contracts in the last week. And then number one on the list, um, staying in the metals complex, is platinum up 7.68 percent um over seven seven one hundred contracts in the last week so a lot of metals on the list of what's leading the way to the light side like you said a lot of things are are moving up and the metals seem to be leading us to uh to the light side <clears throat> on the dark side what is uh what's not working well um in coming in number five is uh is, is certainly is the gasoline contracts is number two to the dark side last week um, it's down, a, you know, a little bit about one percent, almost one percent in the past week. Um, so, you know, a couple couple weeks in a row where that's one struggling a little bit. 
<coughs> excuse me, soybean meal coming in again about down about one percent. Ninety thousand contracts trading last week in soybean meal. Looking across the different soybean complex, heating oil number three down one point seven eight percent. Oats sneaking in there. You know, we got all those oil, meal, etc. Got oats sneaking in there down one point eight point seven percent. Number two on the dark side. And leading the way to the downside this week is Brent, uh, down th- almost four um, percent in the you know. And so you can certainly see a pattern here where you got a little bit of the <laughs> excuse me, a little bit of the energy complex on the dark side, and the metals leading the way on on the light side. Tells me that uh, the market is pricing in a little bit that uh, inflation is in check, as you mentioned, maybe a cooler than expected inflation reading. Um, people thinking inflation's in check, commodities, the energy commodities coming lower, and as a result, perhaps rates Fed coming lower, and that's really giving a little bit of a boost to the metals complex. And so I, that's uh, that's the pattern that seems to be uh, showing up here. I don't know what you see, uh, if you see things any differently there, Mark. Well done, Mr. Rich. Spoken like a true excellence and undergraduate education award winner, sir. I knew you wouldn't shrink from it. You would rise to the occasion. Sometimes when I toss some of my co-hosts on the show, they get a little deer in the headlights reading that list. But you handled it like a pro, sir. Well done out there. Thank you. I I will now give you a break, a little bit of a respite, as we move out there to the Seval Movers and Shakers for the week. Uh, You can see this for yourselves, listeners. Just type CME Group and Seval. This is one of the ones where this tool is not exclusive to premium a Bantix users, you folks can get access to this pretty much anywhere you can get access to that Seaball dashboard listeners. And you go in there, go into the list. There's a variety of different ones you can choose from. Uh, go to the aggregates list. So we're going to look at the aggregates for each of the big complexes and then set the date to one week. And you too can play the home game, if you will, listeners. If we did this, you'd see it's a mostly red week on the vol front with a couple of exceptions. Uh, we'll start to the light side on the vol front first and move our way down. The aggregate metals, Rich was just talking about silver. All this movement in the metals is generating some vol, which is interesting because metals are kind of like rates. They're not usually known as the place to go to for vol, but these days a little bit changing. Uh, the aggregate metals C vol is a little bit north of 20, about 20.4 right now. It's up over half a point this week. That's a big move on the metals vol front. And it's also hanging out at the upper end of that range at a big pop this week, a little over three points, about three and a third points. It was 1705 on the low for the metal sea ball earlier this week. And coming into the start of the show today, it's at the upper end of that of its weekly band at 20.38 right now. So interesting. Metals popping on the ball front. Commodities taking a little bit of a respite today. Again, the aggregate commodities sea ball at a 29.69 off 0.07. But if you look back over the past week, you'll see uh, they are also pretty much at their highs for the week as well. Slightly off of it. The high was 29.76. Uh, but the low was earlier this week at 28.51, so they have bounced well off that. So net on the week, the aggregate commodity C vol is up, even if it is down slightly on the week. Now let's go out to Rich's favorite, his old stomping grounds of FX. Uh, the FX C vol, <laughs> a 6.3. Again, you can probably see why we don't feature FX on the show too often. Not a heck of a lot of vol to be found out there. Even then, that's off about 0.37. So a decent vol move in FX this week. Uh, FX hanging out. Pretty much at their low range for the week as well. Their 630 was the low, which they're hitting today. The high was 668 last week, so pretty much at the low end for the week. Then we go out to energy at an aggregate 40.74. Again, that's averaging your WTIs and your NAT gas. A bunch of things getting roped into that energy aggregate C vol. All that coming in at about a 40 and three quarters, again, off nearly 0.4 on the week. And another one that's kind of hanging out towards the upper end of its weekly band, though. The low was 40.07 earlier this week. The high, 41.12. Coming in to start the show now, we're at about a 40.74. So a bit off the highs, but also about almost three quarters of a point off the lows as well. Then we move on out to AGS, 22.19 out there for the aggregate AG C vol off 0.42 on the week. That's another one that's hanging out at pretty much pinning the needle for the low for the week. In fact, everything else we're going to talk about is at the low for the week right now. The high was 23.38, so they've come off a fair bit in ag vol this week. 
And then we're going out to treasuries at the bottom of our list, listeners. Again, we had a, a CPI number this week, so maybe not entirely surprising that we're seeing treasury vol coming in across the board. Let's start with the treasury price vol. I know that makes a lot more sense for most of you out there. It's at a 5.64. Again, treasuries, not the place to look for vol usually. That's off 0.68. That's a huge vol move on the treasury front. Again, that's at the low for the week. The high was 6.34. You can probably guess when that high was, right before the CPI number. And then if we go out to the Treasury yield vol, a little bit more of an obtuse calculation for most of you, but it's out there, so I like to talk about it as well. That's at a 109.28, off nearly 15 points on the week, 14.99. Also at the low for the week, the high, get this, 124.47, listeners, so... Treasury vol across the board just getting annihilated. Again, not a surprise given what we saw on the inflation front. Inflation is, after all, the key driver of seemingly everything out there these days. So not a surprise we're seeing Treasury vol come in quite a bit post-CPI, but still, that's a pretty large move. So there you go. Most things hanging out towards the lower end of the vol spectrum this week on the C-Vol, with a few exceptions, metals, and even the commodities aggregate and, of course, energy being among them out there. Uh, Rich, I know you kind of held court on inflation this week with your Excel with Options report talking about the impact of inflation and the Fed. Uh, you're looking mostly on gold. So I think because of that, we're going to kick things off in the metals. World's beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everyone, welcome to the metals. Go into that cmegroup.com slash twifo page, then go into your drop down. You're going to go down, oh, almost to the bottom of the list, pretty much. Metals, one above the vol products or vol indices in there. Then we're going to kick things off in the precious, even though a lot can be said for base as well. Uh, precious, we had platinum leading our light side this week, 7.7% to the upside. Again, not the biggest mover from a volume perspective, only 7,100 contracts. Copper getting base at number two, up six and a quarter percent this week, 106,000 contracts on the tape there. So certainly some action we could talk about there, as well as silver number four up 5.57% and about 70,000 contracts on the tape this week. But Rich, in particular, you looked at gold this week. And let's start there. Maybe even before we get there, if you have any thoughts you want to share on what I was just talking about, the, uh, the kind of aggregate sea balls for this week and the fact that most of them, particularly on the Treasury side, are trending to the south, sir. And then with the exception of our friend Metals, I know you broke down Metals this week as well and the impact of inflation. Anything you want to share with our listeners on that report this week as well? Have at it, sir. A twofer for you. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I, I mean, you know, you looking at what we're seeing in the vol market and looking at what we're seeing in the futures market, you, you can definitely see how the market is interpreting the data that's come out, interpreting it as in looking at the unrounded month-on-month -month CPI um, you know, moving potentially a little bit more favorably, price in the Fed, you know, pricing in more rate cuts from the Fed as we look further out in September, December, um, you know, taking a little bit of the edge out of the vol markets in rates, um, which is certainly giving a lift to the metals markets because the metals markets kind of move inversely with rates because of the cost to carry, et cetera. Um, definitely, you know, you're, you're seeing that impact. I think on the metals front, we're in a lot of ways, we're kind of going into uncharted territory in in some of these with at all at all time highs and moving into that kind of place where this might might start moving like a hot knife through butter. And so I think people are looking to either add a little bit of leverage or add a little bit of optionality and convexity to their portfolios in less of just futures. And so I kind of understand that. Um, you know, I'm always, as you mentioned, I always have my eye on FX. And you know, given we just saw an intervention from the Bank of Japan. Um, given we're seeing very weak currencies in in Japan and China and Korea and even the UK against the dollar, I'm <clears throat> I'm a little surprised at the, at the how low vols are. But you know, really, that there's that's not that's I just not where the action is. That's not what the market's focused on. Like you said, they're all focused on inflation, so they're all focused on what's going on in different rates markets and how you know and where the uh, the incremental knock through effects are and i think that metals is, the, is that first first uh thing affected after rates and then i think uh uh 
other risky assets like equities and, and crypto can it gets moved on next. And so um, I will tell you, though, Mark, I, I I look at it and I, I maybe see things a little bit differently than the market. Um, you know, the, of course, the market's always going to be right. You can't no one's bigger than the market. But when I kind of go through the data, you know, I I, I see what people are seeing on, on some parts of the CPI. But uh, PPI came in higher than expected. Um, I still look at the raw, you know, CRB raw industrials index moving higher. Um, I still see easy financial conditions. Um, you know, and in, in you look at the Bloomberg financial conditions. It's it's at the easiest level that we've seen. We've we've only seen this in 2021, 2007, and 1999. So these things all point to higher inflation. We saw import prices today come in much higher than expected. And I think even back to that CPI. If you look at the super core, which is the um, CPI core X housing services component, which the Fed said they used to care about. Maybe they haven't said it in a while, but that's what they used to care about. That's really ultimately wage inflation, right? Which is going to make make this inflation stickier. Um, that number, you know, it was, I think some people, the, the bulls would interpret it and say at 0.42% month on month was the slowest monthly gain we've had this year. But if you look at it on a year on year basis, it's up 4.91% year over year. Um, if we go back to um, the number that came out in November for the end of October, that was only coming in about 2.8% at that point. So that super core has gone up quite a bit in the last six or seven months. Um, and so to me, I look at inflation and say, I don't think inflation's under control by any stretch, even though we've got some unrounded month-on-month -month numbers that look a little bit better. And so the market's trying to talk itself into disinflation and Fed rate cuts. I don't see it that way myself. But that's certainly what the market is is thinking, and you can see that in how the market is interpreting that and in, in, in the moves that we're getting across asset classes. Yeah, interesting. If you want to check out that report for yourselves, listeners, the impact of inflation and the Fed on gold, charting gold futures against the inverse of 10-year Treasury yield. So Rich always has some intriguing analysis for us, and you could certainly – uh, check that out for yourselves out there, listeners. Excel with options. You can find it where you find all of his other research out there. Since he's talking gold, let's go out there right now. Not on our movers and shakers this week. I'm sure if we expanded our top five to probably a top 10 or 15, gold might make it in there. Even though kind of net on the week is not up that much. About a third of a point, a little more than that, or nearly nine handles. Obviously still hanging out well north of the 2000 level. 23, 83, almost 84 as we're kicking off the show. A decent paper on the week this week as well, about 208,000 contracts. You might be forgiven for expecting a little more on a CPI week, but that's kind of what we got out here this week. And the big dog, listeners, was the June contract about 12 days to go, doing about exactly a third of the paper out there. So we're going to hang out out there. What is our... June vol in gold, listeners, 13.73, off about two-thirds of a point. So, again, a vol coming in. But, again, I, you know, the movement in silver and a few others managing to conspire to keep uh, aggregate C vol for metals at the high levels for the week. So, uh, intriguing out there. Again, that's, that's how we look at the aggregates for the entire complex, not just one product, listeners. If you're looking at skew right now in the metals, you know it's going to be bid to the upside, and that's pretty much the case again this week. Uh, the calls in June were 4.2% rich last week. This week, 5.3%. Now, take that with a grain of salt. It's obviously coming against a base level of about 13 and three quarters. So it's not a, a huge premium to the upside or anything, but it's still bid to the upside. The puts last week, 1.8% uh, cheap. This week, 2.3% cheap. So once again, not a ton of interest in the puts and a fair amount of interest in the calls. Now let's go out and see what's lighting it up out there this week on the gold side. I said we're at a 23.83, almost a 23.84 as we're kicking off the show. And it looks like, as I scroll down, sometimes the longer-term paper is the winner out here. But this week looks like it is the June 2400s, listeners, leading the dance. Nearly 11,000 contracts. Kind of light for the big dog in gold this week, but that's what we got, listeners. Uh, almost 11,000. The big day was Wednesday, 3,100. Actually, I take it back. The big day was Monday, 4,100. Mostly opening there, so obviously heading into the CPI number. Uh, 2,000 on Tuesday, mostly closing. 3,100 on Wednesday, also mostly closing. So maybe some folks getting the heck out of Dodge after the number came out. And then about 1,600 today, again, against an OI of 7,400 coming in this morning. So maybe a little bit of back and forth action on the 2,400 strike. And gold this week, not exactly surprising given what we saw out there this week. 
And then number two, we looks like we got some got some put action this week. It's the 2,300 put, 66, almost 6,700 times this week. Uh, the big day for those, Tuesday, 2,700, mostly closing there. About 2,000 yesterday, 1,200 on Monday, and about 750 today. It's like mostly opening the rest of the week. Uh, today has an OI of about 6,500, so could be opening or closing with today's paper, obviously. So 2,300 puts, 2,400 calls, kind of that strangle right around where we're trading. Makes some sense given what we're seeing out here. Now let's look really quickly. Sometimes when you scroll a little bit farther down, you always find the interesting nuggets in the precious metals, listeners. If we go all the way out to August of this year, listeners, we could find the August 2500. Do you like those? Looks like somebody did to the tune of nearly 5,000 times this week. 4,722 to be precise. Uh, the big day was Tuesday, 1,700 on Tuesday, almost 1,700 on Wednesday, opening both days. About 700 today and about 600 and change on Monday. Uh, the OI coming into today, 5,500. So it does seem like some folks piling into the 2,500s in August. That future right now at a 2,406. So close to 100 handles out of the money. Well, you like those listeners? Would you be a buyer or a seller at that level? Given, the, given what we're looking at from a skew perspective, it does seem like people were probably buying those bad boys. And that's usually the way the metals trade. But uh, you never know out there. How about the 2515s, also in August, <laughs> going up 3,000 times this week, 2,300 times yesterday, 700 times today against an OI of 2,400. So clearly yesterday's paper was opening. So if you don't like the 2,500s, allow me to present the 2515s. <laughs> that might be my strike of the week, listeners, just for the sheer ridiculousness of it. And then we've also got, if you want to go a little bit farther out, you want to go out to Jan of next year. How about the 2,900 calls going up 3,100 times this week, listeners? Uh, again, that was the big dog. Jan not doing a bunch of paper this week, only 3.2% of the flow going up in January. Most of that in the 2,900s. Looks like we have a 2,900, 3,000 vertical going up 1,200 times on Monday closing. And then 100 times on Tuesday, and then 1,800 times opening on Wednesday. So they took it off on Monday before the number, and then they put it back on on Wednesday. Again, this is Jan of next year, listeners. So you have a whopping 200, <laughs> 223 days. I don't know why you're opening and closing spreads around CPI in Jan, but that looks like what someone did this week because the OI is about – 2000 on each strike now so there you go rich i don't know are you are you a fan of opening and closing jan verticals around cpi and anything else catching your eye out there in the shiny stuff this week sir uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of doing it like that far out no not at all but uh you know i think the interesting thing on to me on on the metals on specifically on gold is is i understand the the uh, the bull story right the bull story is pivoting around monetary debasement and, and fiscal debasement, really, fiscal concerns and, and stimulus. Um, but I think one of the other things that fundamentally has impacted um, metals, especially gold, um, for a long period of time, you look back 20, 30 years, is real interest rates um, because of that cost of carry effect. And, and you know, while the market is continues to move to new highs on these concerns of, of monetary, potential monetary and fiscal um, debasement, um, the whole idea that Real rates are still quite positive, um, in you know, even on a five-year basis, looking at more, you know, closer, you know, one one and a half percent. That should be suggesting some, you know, some downside here in gold, and that's what I was writing about it, you know, last um, in the last Excel with options. It was it was really kind of along this idea is I get what why people are getting bullish on it, but let's not lose sight of the fact that there is another fundamental that drives these markets, which is the fact that rates are per, you know persistently higher here. Um, and so that's kind of interesting to me. And and so <coughs> to me, I can kind of understand those 2,500, 2,515 type strikes because if I were long gold, I probably would just take it off and buy some calls and say, okay, if it's going to move, it's going to move a lot. Because like I said, we're in kind of uncharted territory. Um, and otherwise, at least they have an embedded put from 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 swapping my long futures into calls. The 2,900, 3,000, I'm not so sure I I can really kind of figure that one out. That's a bit of a head scratcher to me. I just love Rich. Someone came in and said, you know, 2,500 is not doing it for me, but 2,515, that's my strike. That's that's uh, where I'm putting totally. all my paper this week. I love it when, when people pick, let's say, 
esoteric strikes, to put it mildly out there. As we keep on rolling, Rich, we were just talking about the economy and its impact on the metals. It's hard to talk uh, global economy and metals without talking about our number two mover to the light side this week, which was copper. Again, up six and a quarter percent. A banger week out there in copper, 106,000. You go back to the early incarnations of this show, listeners, and copper was, to put it mildly, and also ran on the volume front. Not a ton of options paper going up. Again, 106,000 contracts this week. It's beaten everyone's favorite, silver, this week. Silver's only got 70,000 contracts on the tape. So copper saying, hold my bear kid to silver this week. Uh, coming in this week, 488 in that front future, up almost a quarter of a point or nearly 5%. A vol also popping out here, which again, if you're head scratching as to why the aggregate C vol for metals is up, look no farther than silver and indeed our friend copper out here. Uh, copper vol popping as well. Again, 106,000 contracts on the tape, 28% of that coming in a little bit longer term. The July contract has about 40 days to go. Uh, that vol. 34 even, listeners, up nine and a half points. So Copper Vol, to put it mildly, exploding this week, listener, which is, again, why that metal sea vol is one of the few that's really bucking the trend, both today and on the week. Uh, popping pretty hard this week. If you're looking at skew out here this week, out here in July, listeners, the puts, again, looks like a, a typical precious metal skew out here, but in copper, in the base metals this week. The puts last week were 7.8% cheap, so nobody wanted them. This week, 5.4% cheap, so coming in a little bit, which is interesting given the fact that vol is exploding. And then the calls last week, 10% bid. This week, 5.2% bid. So obviously, a lot was shaping up around that CPI number this week and seeing some of that, even though the vol is up, the skew mitigating this week. Rich, this is a fascinating story out here, copper. Obviously, copper is always seen as a proxy for the Chinese economy. But still, it's fascinating to watch these numbers out here in copper. Uh, what's catching your eye out there in the base metals this week, sir? Yeah, I think I think you're right. Copper is the place to look. I mean, silver is interesting, right? Silver is the, uh, the precious metal with a little bit of an economic kicker on it. So maybe you can win both ways. And so maybe that's what's going on, I would guess, in, in silver. But I think copper is the, the main one you want to focus on. Dr. Copper is a lot of people like to call it because it's PhD in economics. And I think, like you said, it's the PhD in Chinese economics. And um, it's not just copper that's been um, that's been pretty strong of late and dry, attracting a lot of interest. Um, even though a lot of people think Chinese equities are uninvestable because of the government involvement, um, Chinese equities have quietly um, been starting to outperform global equities in the last two or three months. And that's, I think, something where they're still – if we look at a longer period of time, are are massively beaten down. And so maybe this is just a bit of a dead cat bounce. But um, it's something where I think when you see both of them starting to move in the same direction, it's worth taking note, worth kind of, uh, you know, keeping it in the back of your mind, because maybe there's something kind of brewing there where the, the Chinese economy is starting to come come to life, which really no, one, no one's expecting. They were expecting a lot last year and it never really happened. Maybe it was just it's starting to come to life now. So I think copper is the place where I'm going to keep my my eye to to see what develops there in the, in the Chinese economy. Let's see what's developing this week, shall we, listeners? Vol is exploding. Volume is exploding. Where is it all lining up? Uh, Twenty nine, so about thirty percent going up. And actually, in the uh, in the June contract out here in copper, listeners, which is kind of interesting. That has about twelve days to go. Uh, so we're going to hang our hat out there. And what is the big dog out here this week in copper? Like we said, copper at a 488 in that future coming into the start of the show. Well, it's upside. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> it's the 5.1, the 510 calls out here, listeners, going up almost 4,300 times this week. The big day, almost all of that Tuesday. So again, hard to argue this is not uh, CPI driven out here. 3,300 contracts on Tuesday. Mostly opening, only 600 yesterday, closing 140 today, 188 on Monday. So not a lot of paper outside of that big spurt on Tuesday, but enough to take the top spot in a pretty active product. Right behind it, number two, we have the five even call. So 510 is a little bit, again, too esoteric for you. Allow me to present the five even calls going up 3,300 times this week. Looks like paper may be bailing or perhaps even rolling on these. Uh, they dumped 1,600 each Tuesday and Wednesday. 
Looks like they could have rolled to the five tens on Tuesday because, again, a lot of opening paper on the five tens as they were closing on the fives. Also, the 1,600 of the fives going up closing on Wednesday as well. Not a ton of paper outside of that, so could have been someone just bailing on those as well. Only 42 today. So, again, this very much event-driven paper this week. Uh, 3,300 contracts there for the number two spot. And then we got to have to go out a little bit to... The 490 calls, again, in July. We were talking July earlier. That's a pretty action-packed week as well out there. July doing 27.9%. So looked like it might have been the number one spot, but actually it was June with 29.7%. But a hot fight between June and July this week out here in Copper, listeners, as we break down some more of this paper, including... Uh, to the upside again we go, the 490s out here in June. Again, 40 days to go, going up 3,200 times this week. Again, no surprise, the action on Tuesday and Wednesday. About 1,200 on Tuesday and 1,200 again on Wednesday, opening both days. Uh, only about 400 today against an OI of 1,500 and 400 on Monday. So interesting, opening both days, but not the entirety of that volume Tuesday and Wednesday because the OI coming in today was only a total of 1,500. So intriguing stuff, 490s, again, uh, that makes some sense, listeners, given that the future's at a 488. We're almost pretty much at that level already. Let's go a little bit farther out, as we like to do in the metal, see if we can see any other interesting and or aberrant paper. Five calls here in August with about 70 days to go. They went up 3,400 times this week, listeners. So the story of the week is definitely upside in copper, listeners. Again, five calls going up about 3,400 times. Again, surprise, surprise, all Tuesday and Wednesday. Wednesday, 1,600, almost 1,200 on Tuesday, opening both days. 650 today against an OI of about 2,700, a whopping four on Monday. So again, all event-driven paper, followed by the five half calls in October, going up uh, 2,700 times as well this week. So just an action-packed Upside call palooza here in copper this week, listeners. Uh, five half calls in October going up again nearly 3,000 times this week. The big days, surprisingly, 15, almost 1,600 today against an OI of about 1,800. So maybe some folks are bailing on these today. They were certainly bailing yesterday 1,100 times. Looks like they may have bailed on the four and three quarters as well 1,100 times. So maybe... They had a four and three quarters, five half vertical on in October, and they got the heck out of Dodge on that yesterday. Either way, size closing paper on both of those strikes. And they continued trading the five halves today another 1,600 times against an OI of about 1,800. So they could be bailing. They could be done on their upside <laughs> here in October, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Rich, I don't know. It looks like the tale of the week is uh, upside calls in the metals, sir. What do you think? Yeah, it <clears throat> sure certainly is. And, and um, I don't see... Right now, I think with the with the data that we've had come out, I think there's really nothing um, in over the next couple. As you look out over the next few weeks, there's nothing you could see that's really going to slow that down um, until maybe things get a little bit too too stretched technically. So, I think it's kind of showing you that people are are starting to feel pretty comfortable with this move, this direction, and and are, and are layering in and adding to their their position as they go on is would be my guess. And as we add to the show with some more products, listeners coming in once again on our movers and shakers list, like it does almost every week, it's Nat gas. So let's head out to energy next. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, Nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners go into that drop down, go up. From the metals, you're going to go up all the way, almost not quite to the top of the list, three from the top, to energy, and then we're going to click on Nat Gas from there. Nat Gas coming in at number three, up over 5.5% this week. And again, we were talking about this with Carly last week. It's easy for a product that's hanging out around $2 to have big percent moves. But what's also fascinating is that we're not just seeing percent moves and then a 1,000 contracts like we're seeing in Bitcoin, right? No, we're seeing... 700,000, 715 now, 15,000 more going up since the start of the show. So Nat Gas is trading. It's not just moving out there. Coming in to start of the show, man, another banger week, up to two and a half. Did you have this impressive Nat Gas rally over the last couple of weeks in your back pocket? 
you know, May, the start of summer driving season, not typically a, a banger period for upside in energy. Yet that's what we're seeing out here last couple of weeks, listeners. Two and a half even in that nat gas future right now. Like we said, a 715,000 contracts on the tape. So you can add up almost all the metals together. And they may not equal what we've got going on just in nat gas this week. So again, another banger week. You folks are clearly grokking to what's going on out there in energy this week. 51, almost 52% of the paper going up with just about 11, almost 12 days to go out there. So my goodness, <laughs> just a, a banger period out there for near dated nat gas options out there. 52% going away in 12 days. So again, everyone's fixated on, let's say, equities with the near-dated explosion, pun intended, but no, NatGas, they can play in that party as well. That future, like I said, at a two and a half right now. Uh, the vol, what is the vol in NatGas? 55 and a third, up six points on the week. So vol popping out here as well, no doubt contributing to our energy, C-Vol, being one of the few that is towards the upper end of its weekly band this week, net gas. Explosive on the vol front, as you would expect. Skew-wise, not an explosive week on the skew front. A little bit of action. The puts last week, about 1% bid. This week, 2.6% bid. So a little bit of a premium to the puts. The calls last week, about flat. This week, 3.4% cheap. So the skew with about 12 days to go, slotting into mildly, I would say, bearish territory, but nothing to write home about. We also have had a pretty big move to the upside last couple of weeks, so some folks could just be uh, taking some profits and getting the heck out of Dodge. Rich, I'm not sure if you were the one who had this massive upside move in that gas in your back pocket. If so, uh, congrats to you. You're sitting on some profits this week, but what's catching your eye out there in that gas? A, a much juicier that gas than a few weeks ago, sir. It sure is, and this is one that, um, again, I think last time um, I was on the show, we even talked about it, and you know, Nat Gas has been trying to form a bottom for several months, right? February through April is in that one and a half to two range, kind of trading both sides of that range. One and a half kept holding as we kept probing the downside. And and now it's kind of turned around. And once it broke above two, um, the, you know, just the measured move to two and a half in, in a short order makes sense. And actually looking at some other charts, it, you know, it, this could actually, this could probably stretch to 275, 280 before it gets um, too overextended here in the very short term. So there might even be a little bit more upside, um, you know, in that gas right now. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting because when we talk about um, the metals responding well because of what maybe we're seeing a little bit, a little bit more health come back in the the Chinese economy, the growth metrics we're seeing in the U.S. economy, inflation might be cooling, but that might be because the growth metrics are slowing down a little bit. A lot of the uh, the measures on growth and manufacturing, retail sales, housing starts, building permits, et cetera, have actually been worse than expected, um, leading to you know, some downside expectations for growth. So it's a little surprising to see nat gas perking up here. I think a lot of it, though, had everything to do. It seems like a very technical move to me and not one that's being really kind of catalyzed by people's changing views on fundamentals. Yeah, I did not have a explosive move to two and a half over the last couple of weeks in my bingo card. So I clearly missed out on this one, <clears throat> Mr. Rich. Let's see what the paper is going on out there. And it's the two half calls, not surprising, going out in about in about 12 days, listeners, that were leading the dance this week. 36,000 times. Seems like folks were mostly bailing on them this week, which, again, makes sense. You've had, a, again, explosive, pun intended, upside move to this strike. When you shoot right to the strike, folks who are sitting on some of these calls – probably going to take them off. They want to take some profits. Also, if they're short them, they're probably getting spooked. They want to get the heck out of Dodge. So it makes a lot of sense that as we rally to the strike, we see a lot of closing paper. And that's pretty much what we saw yesterday and today, people bailing on about 12,000 contracts each against an OI of about 25,000. 8,500 on Monday. Folks were buying then, or at least opening then. So some opening on Monday, 4,000 on Tuesday. Again, a, a banger week. 36,000. You add that and just the two and three quarter, or even not even the two puts also in June. You add those two together, 
You've got about 72,000 contracts. Just those two options, you have more than the entirety of the Silver Complex listeners. And you're closing in on copper. Again, that shows you how active NatGas is these days. Who says you don't need options on an underlying when it gets sub five bucks? <laughs> NatGas is, is the uh, complete counterpoint to all of that out there. 36,000 also of the two puts in June going up this week. People bail on these, seems like, as well. 18,000 of them going up on Monday. So fully half on Monday. Folks closing there. So I guess as we rallied away from the strike, folks taking their puts, getting the heck out of Dodge. Uh, 7,000 each on Tuesday and Wednesday. Back and forth opening to closing. Slightly opening on Tuesday, slightly closing on Wednesday. So a little bit of back and forth paper there. And 3,500 today against an OI of, get this, 59,000. So there's still nearly 60,000 of these two puts open. Uh, they have 12 days to go. If you're long these puts, you, you need a pretty aggressive reversal. And if you short these, you're hoping we hang out here for a while and don't retest those lows. All right, behind it, if two and a half calls weren't optimistic enough for you listeners, how about the two and three quarters going up almost 30,000 times this week? 29,500. The big day was today. 14,200 today against an OI of about 22,000. 9,000 yesterday, mostly opening. 5,500 on Monday. And then about 600 on Tuesday. So quiet day on Tuesday. Now, if we roll a little bit farther out, if we go out to July, it has about 40 days to go. We also had some action on the two puts there as well. So the two puts not being forgotten. There's a lot of upside, but there are some two puts sliding it up out here this week to the tune of 32, almost 33,000 of these bad boys going up in July as well. So these would actually slot in at number two on the overall volume chart for NatGas this week. Again, the big day was Wednesday, banger day on Wednesday. Nearly 22,000 of these two puts in July going up on Wednesday. So somebody really loved these. Also worth noting, 11,000 of the two and a quarter puts, but they were opening on both. So maybe they opened a one by two. They, they bought the two and a quarter, sold two of the twos. Does kind of line up that way. You like that, listeners? Two and a quarter, two, one by two put spread. Not the worst way to do it. Maybe if you line it up right, you can get that put spread for a credit. If you retreat back to two, you get the put to you, but you got a nice little, nice little break even level on those. And if it keeps rallying, you're not really shelling out a ton for it. So that could possibly be what we saw out there. Either way, 22,000 of the two puts going up on Wednesday, 4,000 each Tuesday and today, and about 3,000 on Monday. Again, OI of 55,000. So somebody clearly has a sizable ax to grind on the two puts. In July, listeners. But you know what, Rich? We're coming up against it. And I want to squeeze in one more because we haven't talked about equities a while on the show. And I know you did some interesting analysis and in one of my certainly most compelling indices to watch out there. So without further ado, let's head out into the equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, listeners, let's do it. Pop into that drop down one final time. Pop out of energy. Go down one slot to equity indexes. Then we're going to hang our hats, listeners, in a product we used to talk about a lot here on the show. And I've said many times this year, on the equity landscape is certainly one of the indexes that is catching my eye the most these days, which is small caps. Rich, you recently crunched some numbers on your Excel with Options report talking about how recent market data impacts the Russell 2000 futures. So sounds like you're siding with me that in terms of interesting indexes to watch, the rut is the one to beat. What's catching your eye out there in the Russell 2000 these days, sir? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, looking at the Russell, I think what I was looking at in Excel with options this week was the fact that, as I just mentioned, <clears throat> the data has been consistently coming in worse than expected. And so, you know, on that, I'm looking at the Citigroup economic surprise index, which isn't necessarily looking so much at the absolute level of data. What it's looking at is how data comes in relative to expectations. And so yeah, let's assume that some amount of <coughs> excuse me, consensus is priced in. So is this data coming in better or worse than expectations? And since the start of April, this index has kind of collapsed, really. It's a generally mean reverting index, but it's collapsed and it's at the, the low points of the year in terms of the data coming in worse than expected. And what I did is I, I looked at that and I overlaid that versus um, just like the generic two-year um, two uh, bills uh, futures. And, and <laughs> that kind of points to the fact that this level of data coming in worse than expected 
would suggest that we're going to see lower short-term interest rates. So kind of back to what we were talking about before, market thinking that the Fed's going to start cutting. And so maybe not so much this year before the election, but certainly in the near term, maybe even right after the election, which is where you see the cuts really start to kick in and, and accumulating over the next two years. And then if you take that two-year future and assume uh, lower yields out to two years um, and overlay that versus the forward PE of the Russell 2000, you can see a, a really tight fit. And what you see is that lower yields um, would suggest a much higher forward PE, which makes sense, right? Because ultimately the multiple you pay for stocks is um, inversely correlated to the cost of capital those stocks are facing. And if the cost of capital is going lower, that's going to, you know, you're going to lead to higher multiples. The, this, the companies that would most benefit from, from a lower cost of capital would be the small cap stocks. Um, we see from a lot of survey data, whether it be the NFIB surveys or even going through company earnings, it's the small businesses that are getting hurt the most by higher yields. And so they stands to reason they would be the ones that would benefit the most. And <clears throat> when we think about what was the, the broadening out of the rally where at the end of last year, where we were really getting excited that this rally had some meaningful legs to it, it was when the small caps really started to um, to kind of catch up and, and take part. We saw an explosive mo move at the end of last year in small caps. Now, they've given a lot of that back and, and really through this year. You know the small caps have um, have really not participated too much in, in in the party at all. You know they're barely up for the year. At one point before I think, before, <coughs> excuse me, looking at last week, they were actually kind of down at one point. So I just looked at that and said, okay, this would suggest if we are going to get lower, uh, if we're going to get the Fed in play and the Fed's going to be lowering rates, it seems stands to reason that small caps might be the one that are most potentially uh, impacted and benefited from this. You can see looking through the data, people are not really positioned for that at all. And then layer into that another potential catalyst is that here we are in May and people are starting to position and think about and focus on the Russell 2000 rebalance and what that means and the names are going to get it added in, names taken out, et cetera. So they're, they're, from a catalyst standpoint, getting the market to focus on the Russell 2000 because of that annual rebalance, um, you know, they might be starting to focus on the fact that, that this is an index that could have some catch up to do. And so I looked through that and I looked at where, um, you know, we, we have seen in the past that volume and open interest, um, certainly in, in the Russell 2000 futures and, and options um, tend to spike on a quarterly basis. Um, you know, we see big spikes on a quarterly basis and we particularly see a move higher for that June rebalance, which makes sense as a lot of people are positioning around that. And so I looked at where the, the <coughs> where that um, those strikes were setting up and you're looking at the fact that we have a fair bit of skew priced in. Um, of course, we always have skew favoring the puts in, in equity indices, but um, you know, the calls are trading below the at the monies. You've got, you've got a, kind of a regular, if not a little bit more pronounced skew in the puts. And so I said, you know, there might be potential upside in here. It's an index that's been kind of left behind. People might start looking at this. There's a fundamental reason if the Fed is going to lower rates, why this should start to, to pick up. And so I said, well, if you want to be bullish on the Russell, and now might be a good time to do so, you can take this skew and you know and use it um, to your benefit um, and sell one of the. I looked at where where the volume was kind of concentrated, and I went out to June and said, you know, selling one of the 1950 puts, um, I could use that premium to buy three of the 2250 calls out to June. Um, and if you look, if you think about it, um, you you know, obviously short some puts, you're going to have some downside potential risk. Um, if you're willing to buy the futures, you wouldn't really have any more risk than that. In fact, that break even would kick in lower, but you've got leverage to the upside move. And if nothing really happens, um, net net, there's no premium. Actually, you probably took in, I think if I remember correctly, you take, take in a small amount of premium there. So you're not gonna really give anything up. Um, but if you do get that move to the upside in the Russell, if you do get that move um, higher in in multiples, if you, s you start to see people focusing on it, you could have a leverage to a, a pretty good move. And um, that, that kind of showed when you look at through the expected returns, that kind of leveraging that that upside view and, and relying on uh, skew to do that um, was potentially fortuitous. And I felt that if you're willing to be long futures here, this is a better way to play the potential upside in Russell. Of course, understanding the risk of, of selling puts um, in, in any sort of product like that.
Fascinating stuff. Mr. Rich, again, you can check out those reports for yourselves over there. Excel with options. We're coming up against it, so we're going to kind of run through here, listeners. But decent paper, all things considered, out here in the Russell 2000 options this week. Nearly 50,000 contracts, 48,000. So it's starting to tussle with silver out there in terms of relative volume levels if you want to see where Russell 2000 is slotting in these days. Certainly a far cry from the 10 to 12,000 it used to do on a regular basis back when we talked about it a lot on the show. And, you know, there's the usual explosion of near-dated, shall we say, paper out here. In fact, 36% of the overall volume is going up in the contract that expires in one day tomorrow. But what fascinates me about the rut is that we also see paper a little bit farther out, including about almost 25% of the paper this week in the June contract. It has about 35 days to go. In fact, the most active contract out here this week, listeners, is the 2,000 even puts in June. They went up 3,347 times. By the way, that June future at a 2110 right now. So 110 handle, I should say, out of the money puts going up again 33, almost 3,400 times uh, this week out here, listeners. So intriguing stuff. Something more fun to sink our teeth into than just the surfeit of endless zero-day paper. And these were active pretty much all week. 1,000 on Monday, 500 on Tuesday, 1,000 again on Wednesday, and nearly 1,000 today. So pretty active. All that against an OI of 2,200. So folks loading up maybe on some 2,000 even puts. You know, when we used to talk run on the show of your week, 2,000 was clearly a very important psychological level. Maybe some folks are buying these thinking that we might be breaking through, testing that level again. Maybe some folks are overwriting them, saying that, uh, you know what, we don't think we're going to be hitting that way anytime soon. Uh, the put skew mildly expanding this week, so it's hard to really read too much into that. It was 4.6% bid last week, 5% bid. That's actually overall fairly cheap for a major index. So I would hope they would be buying these rather than selling those. That's something we're seeing kind of across the board. A lot of the major indexes, the put skew right now, not, uh, not perhaps as juicy as you might think. Maybe an indication of the complacency out there. Either way, if it, maybe if you're intrigued or a little bit concerned, you want to put a little bit of downside hedging on. Not the most expensive time to do it. Speaking of time, listeners, we are coming up against it. All right, listeners, that music unfortunately means we have come to the end of another sojourn through the world of futures options. Rich, excellent job on the show here this week, sir. And if folks want to check out all those reports we just talked about, or maybe some of the others you've got cranking out out there, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. I always enjoy being on here. So, yeah, first place you want to look, uh, go to the CME website, look under the Insights tab, and you'll find my Excel with options. Please feel free to sign up and subscribe to that. Get it right to your inbox. I'm um, coming out every other week talking about different markets and trying to find some ideas that of ways that we can use options to express our views. Um, if you want a little bit more from me, um, just on the general macro landscape, um, go to Substack and sign up for my Stay Vigilant Substack or follow me on, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, at, at Twitter, you can find me at, at, at Excel Richard. Um, love, to, love to have people um, follow, love to have people dialogue. I always, I like the dialogue. I, I think we all learn a lot from that. So, um, but definitely check out the Excel with options on, on the CME website. There you go. Check it out. CMEgroup.com, the place to find Rich's reports. Also the place to find our reports, the Twifo reports. While you're messing around on the CME website out there, you should also check out a little bit of the old CVOL over there. Just type CME and CVOL if you can't find it. You have to dig a little bit on the website. I get it. It's hard to find. But if you're intrigued by all this vol analysis we're talking about here on the show, it's definitely one to watch. I know Rich utilizes it in a lot of his analysis as well. So check it out. It is very interesting. Speaking of vol, we're back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, talking all things vol, domestic and international on Volatility View. Should be a fun one. Join us tomorrow. After that, back one final time for the week exclusively for our pro folks over there on options oddities then we're back again on monday with the option block all the way through to next thursday another episode of this week in futures options stay safe out there everybody 
This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 